USA webinar in just one moment. Uh, but first, I'd like to do a little bit of housekeeping. You will see there is a chat box. If you're on a computer, it's to the right of your screen. If you are on a tablet or a smaller device, it might be below these images. If you could just go to that chat box and let me know if you can see and hear me OK. And um, Michael and Diana, maybe you guys could say hi and wave so we can make sure they can hear you too. OK. Hi, everybody. Um, Welcome. We're so happy that you're going to be part of this, and we hope you enjoy it. Hi, I'm Michael. Very excited to have you here. Looking forward to this very much. Excellent. And it looks like we're coming through loud and clear. If anyone is having any difficulty hear hearing or seeing, you might want to try a Chrome browser or a Firefox browser. Or rest assured, we will be sending you a full recording of this session after the fact. So you will be able to see and hear all of the information later. It's not ideal, but if you're having problems, at least have that confidence. You can see it later. Mm -hmm. um, all right. Got, there's so many of you today. I, I'm so glad you're as excited about this content as I am because I have really been looking forward to this. We are waiting for one participant, Nancy Ross, who's having some technical difficulties, but it looks like we're getting her through now. Hopefully she can see and hear us. She's been having audio problems this morning. Um, I'm going to introduce our three speakers and um, then we'll get rolling. First, I would like to thank MJSA. MJSA produces this webinar series for its membership and now during the COVID crisis for the entire jewelry industry. We normally do them every third Thursday. Um, during this time of um, pause, we are doing one every single week and we're focusing on content that will help you now to deal with the crisis and also to bring our businesses back when this crisis passes. So thank you so much to, to MJSA for everything you do for the industry. Um, now I'd like to introduce our speakers. If you see my eyes darting around, it's because I can't remember all this. I'm looking at my notes. Um, I'd like to first welcome Diana Singer. Diana is a, the third generation of a family jewelry business that was in operation from 1920 to 1979. She graduated magna cum laude from NYU with a double major in French and political science, so she, produced, she pronounces all this jewelry correctly. And she won a silver medal in fencing in the Maccabiah Games. And for those of you who don't know, those are the Jewish Olympics. So that's pretty impressive. She says she doesn't remember what year that was. Um, in the 70s, she earned her GG from GIA, and then she went on to manage Antoinette's Jewelry in San Francisco. She's owned D&E Singer since 1989, and she puts that GG degree and her family history to great use buying and selling estate jewelry and gemstones. She's a frequent speaker at jewelry industry events, and she's been president of the American Society of Jewelry Historians since 2016. Next, I'd like to welcome Michael Cohen. Michael is known as passionate, insane sometimes, insatiable when it comes to jewelry knowledge and sharing it. Uh, the allure of jewelry has always fascinated him. And um, he's been in the industry for over 50 years, though he does not look old enough for that to be true. He designs, he makes, he teaches, he appraises, he sells. Uh, he's a beloved fixture at FIT, and we're really delighted to have him with us today. Nancy is a jewelry image and stylist and marketing consultant. She combines three decades of experience as an educator, a communicator, and a marketing professional. She's an associate adjunct professor and career counselor at FIT, where she primarily counsels students in the marketing, communication, and jewelry design area. She's created and conducted educational programs, including professional panache and the business of jewelry. And she serves as a moderator at the JCK annual conference and she presents frequently for the industry. Um, she is also um, a gemologist with her certification from FIT and she's a member of numerous jewelry industry associations. Together, these three bring an incredible wealth of jewelry history knowledge. So what we're going to do for you today is have this conversation about how Global crises have affected jewelry and jewelry business. And the, I'll, I'll give you a spoiler here. Global crises don't kill the jewelry business. The jewelry business constantly refines and reformats and reorganizes and finds ways to reach consumers with jewelry because consumers always want jewelry. So today we're going to give you some of that information and hopefully some great ideas for you about how changing consumer psyche and response to this crisis could be interpreted through your own brand or your own design language or your own curation of jewelry in your store. 
So th those are the, we're giving you this history today so you have that context. So I'm going to share my screen and we're, we've got a bunch of slides to show you and we'll go back and forth between talking heads and pictures. Um, but I guess I'd just like to start with saying, we're gonna focus what, mostly on World War I, Great Depression, World War II today? Is that where I think we uh, I think the three of us agree that we needed to put it within the context and we wanted to show two images of what preceded the jewelry in World War II because you had the Edwardian era. OK, so I go here then. So the first image is the portrait image. Yes, we have here Queen Alexandra, who is the wife of Edward, uh, son of Queen Victoria and hence the term Edwardian jewelry. Um, if you look at it in the context, it's very lacy, it's very ladylike. And then if you go to the next image. Which I can do with a little slowness, okay. All right, so here is a typical example of elegant Edwardian jewelry. It's lacy, it's light, it's made of platinum. It has older cut stones. Uh, there's relief in the airspace. So there's not a huge amount of density in the design. And this is something to keep in mind because in the Art Deco period, you are going to see a little bit more density. Michael or, or um, Nancy, did you want to talk a little bit about the use of platinum? Yes, also too, the fact of the matter is platinum was brought into the idea of a new metal to work with in the 1870s, actually in 1820. Uh -huh. And by the time, and by the time Alexandra came along, they were tired of Victoria. She basically started this in the 1890s, but it didn't pick up because we had to develop new machinery and new technology. Most of the jewelry tools you are working with today came because of platinum in 1900. So this look started in the 19th, but this is really a 20th century phenomena. And industry liked platinum, but they weren't overly concerned with it at this point pre-World War I. And additionally, I believe, if I recall correctly, uh, platinum has a very high melting point, and the oxyacetylene torch was invented in the late, late 1800s, so it was then possible for jewelers to work with this extraordinary metal, which is very malleable, yet very, very durable, and hence you could get these very lightweight but solid and durable mountings in which to this, this is the whole thing of this is the whole concept about Edwardian jewelry and what was preceding World War I is the fact that they could make these so incredibly light, they almost feel like tin, but they hold together. The tensile strength is much better than gold. Uh -huh. So when people think they can put platinum and it's indestructible of the Edwardian period, it's not. It will crush, uh -huh. but it will crush a lot later than a piece of gold would. So the appearance of this period was lacy. It was intimate. You were up close. You were talking. This was not a statement for anyone. It was your partner. It was your dinner companion. Mm -hmm. This was not meant to, to, it was meant to be showy, but not meant to show who you are. Went to the theater, you glittered, but you didn't know the details. So then we had uh, World War I, which uh, was from 1914 to 1918. And the thing that's uh, noticeable about World War I, it was a cataclysmic war that was different from ways wars had been fought prior to this. There was mustard gas, there were planes, there were different kinds of bombs, and thousands and thousands of young men were killed and maimed during this war. And I think that it really changed the way people looked at everything. Now, these particular images, I believe, were offered by Michael, or I'm not sure, um, Nancy, yeah. are these your images or Michael's? These are my images, um, okay. um, Andrea. Yeah, the um, the images of this, it's a very interesting point. World War I was interesting in the point that for us, they were. this was the first time government in the US was considering restricting platinum. It was used to make bombs at this point. And it, as, 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 as Diana said, it has an incredibly high melting point. So they're able to use it in very high tension engines and tanks. But remember, World War I didn't have all the play toys that World War II had. So they were considering it. And this freaked out the jewelry industry. The last year of the war was 1917. Then when we were asking the industry, could you not use the stuff? 
and they got nervous. And of course, the government said, we're not going to restrict it. It's for personal. That was a lie. The two sources were Russia, that's by the wayside, and Colombia. They didn't particularly like South American governments. So really, World War I saw the first essence of restriction. It never got restricted. And you know why? Because it ended. <laughs> right, now these are these are um, these are costume jewelry pins. Is that not and correct? These are, and these are costume jewelry pins. This was actually made by a lot of individuals. And you see that the V is incorporated as a design element. It's not. It's there, but it's not there. They're the masks of two items. Britain and England were the two majors. So this was by Ellen N. It could have been. It's probably made in America, England. They didn't have the ability to make it. They, they, they didn't have much ability at that point. Um, so this was, next. Next. Wait, 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 Nancy, uh, did you have something to say about costume jewelry? Can we hear her? Nancy? I'd still be having some sound problems, Diana. Mm, that's a shame. Yeah, yeah, because these are costume pieces. This was meant for everyone to see it. This wasn't meant for the intimate boardroom. You wore this on your lapel, you wore it wherever. And so these were not necessarily worn as jewels in the traditional sense. They were worn as solidarity and badges of honor during the course of the war. Right, and you, right. And you would also trot this out every year at your veterans or armistice days, as it's called. Okay. All right, here? All right. So um, now let's speak a little bit about what happened during the Deco period. Um, what brought on the Deco period? Prior to the Deco period, look back on history. In 1920, women had the right to vote. You had prohibition starting in 1920. In 1918, it was the end of the war. And I think with everything people had been through during all the deprivation of World War I, they wanted something different and different indeed is what they wound up with. Um, many of you might be familiar with what is referred to as the 1925 Exposition des Arts Décoratifs, which is actually uh, the term from which the word deco is derived. This um, conference of design, which took place in Paris, was actually supposed to take place in 1915, but due to the World War, they were not capable of doing it during that teen period, so it was changed to 1925. But what all of us would like you to notice here is look at the whiteness and the geometry of these pieces. Look at the use of fancy shaped diamonds, which prior to this you did not see in pieces. Look at the geometry in the pieces, look at the symmetry, look at the whiteness. This is a stark contrast to that lacy, delicate, filigree sort of thing that you saw in the Edwardian period prior. And if you look at the, at the 1920s, you're talking about a bunch of people who went through for their most part, they had wars before and war was a part of life much more so than we see it today. Um, so this was in their eyes, a phenomenal period where everything is being revisited. Anything that was even remotely grandmother is out the window. So they are looking for new developments in stones. There is almost a an abandonment that you get right after the war and you get the exaltation, but you also get a waywardness. You get a lot of different influences and not one predominates as, as we will see in a couple of other slides. Now in the next image, um, do we have the next one? All right. So one of the things we have to keep in mind during the 20s, they had used planes during World War I. So of course, plane travel became quite the thing and people were able to travel to parts of the world where in the past it would have been extremely difficult or in fact impossible for them to go there. Um, the Kempier brothers traveled worldwide to source designs and stones. And these particular pieces you see here actually were the property of Linda Porter, the wife of Cole Porter, the famous songwriter. Um, the bracelet in the middle was made in 1929 and the accompanying clips at the top were made a few years later in the 30s. But what I think the three of us would like you to notice is the geometry in these pieces, but also this extraordinary explosion of color. When you think about the Art Deco period, I think the first thing everybody thinks about is the combination of stark colors, orange with black, 
red against blue and green and all these oriental sort of combinations. And these particular pieces that you see here were called tutti frutti, which essentially means all the fruits because Cartier went over to India and he bought hundreds of parcels of these carved stones. And when he brought them back to Paris, his designers figured out a way to incorporate all these small carved gemstones into these beautiful, very typical of the Art Deco period pieces. And in, and in the point of the 1920s, before World War I, very few people traveled more than 50 miles from their hometown mm -hmm. in the U.S. So the second they got over to Europe and the ones who survived, they saw what was going on. People didn't believe it. They brought this back from fine jewelry to the costume at every level. And mm -hmm. it actually kept Deco, this period alive, for about 10 more years than Europe. Europe had moved on. We didn't. We stayed with this interest. Mm -hmm. Yes, of course, because the, the influences usually started in Europe. And then, as yeah. Michael says, around a decade or so later, there was an explosion of the style in the United States. Right. Now, in the next, we still have lost Nancy, right? Oh, yeah. I'm sorry. Uh, in the next image, um, we wanted to give you a little bit of a taste of the concept of exoticism right. and all the different parts of the world that designers in the 20s reached out to, to source inspiration. Uh, for example, if you look at the bracelet on the left made by Van Cleef and Arpel, you see that it's a, an Egyptian motif. Um, Tutankhamun's tomb was, was discovered again in 1925, and there was an explosion of interest in Egyptian-influenced things. And if you look at the tiny colored stones uh, cut into the motif, those are called calibre, C-A-L-I-B-R-E, literally meaning calibrated, calibrated cut to fit the particular design motif in the mounting. Um, in the center, you have... Um, a cigarette box from Cartier, but we chose that one to show you this, this vaguely Persian influence with these wonderful animals leaping on a gold background. And then on the right at the top, there's a very classic Chinese sort of motif in this beautiful little Cartier desk clock from 1928. Look at how geometric it is. Look at the juxtaposition of the color between the orange and the black. These are typically Art Deco things, which are a huge departure from the whiteness and the laciness and the delicacy of the Edwardian period. And then just under that, there's an extraordinary bracelet that actually belonged to the famous um, opera singer, Gana Walska, who was mm. probably not such a wonderful opera singer, but she was she was wonderful at marrying very, very wealthy husbands of whom she had six. <laughs> and um, this wonderful bracelet was designed by Cartier in 1928, and when it's, it was owned by Gana Walska. What also happened in this period that, as, as um, Diana was mentioning with the Stones of the Calibre, even more importantly, the Art Deco period wouldn't have happened if the Americans hadn't embraced a standard form of cutting smaller diamonds, which we refer to as melee. If you look at the background in that, all those stones are matching. That was totally opposite as to what Europe was producing. They wanted weight. We wanted a standardized size. So without the American impetus, we always do that. We take from others and we make it even better. Um, the Art Deco period wouldn't have happened if we didn't have, as Diana mentioned, the Calibre stones and the round diamond melee. And the interesting thing about the Chimera bracelet, which is what those were called, terminals have been around for eons. But the fact is that they were finding found objects coming back from the Orient. You have soldiers coming in with all sorts of tokens, and they saw it. And Cartier, Van Cleef began traveling to pick up these objects. And they just incorporated them in their jewelry of the period. So exoticism and traveling was what we embraced very quickly in the 1920s. And once again, I think it's important to mention all of this travel would not have been possible had it not for the beginning of the usage of airplanes. I don't, I'm not exactly sure about this, but I think Pan Am, an airline that had been in business for a number of years and they're no longer here, but I believe they actually started in the 1930s. So you had this plane travel that was taking people all over the world. And this was a direct result of World War One. Right. This is this was a crisis awareness situation. After World War One, people are heightened. They're looking around. They would never look at things before. And they realize there's a big world. And America up until this point and still is to a degree 
not particularly fond of other influences. They're entranced by them. But it was the 1920s that we embraced global motifs. And I think one other point that we all need to take away from the 1920s is, as we had spoken about earlier, World War I was fought in a terribly brutal way that had never been experienced before by soldiers. And I think the effect was so noticeable on civilization that people wanted to just come home and have fun. They wanted to drink, they wanted to go to parties, they wanted to enjoy whatever little bit of money success had given them, and they wanted to have fun. Hence, you have schools that have um, cocktail uh, bottles, um, um, things that show that people are having a good time. Everybody wanted to have a good time in the 1920s. And that is where we get the term the Roaring Twenties, because they certainly were roaring, and it was a direct result of everything that had happened in World War One. And it was a conspicuous consumption period. Oh, yes. For those who had money, it was a conspicuous consumption period. Mm-hmm. And uh, parenthetically, There is no period in time where everybody didn't have money. There have always been periods of time where people had plenty of money to buy expensive jewelry. Even now. Even now. All right. So the next image, um, I am culpable for putting this image in because um, from a personal standpoint, this is my absolute favorite piece of jewelry on the planet. Um, It's called a pectoral, which means it's a very large jewel and it sits pretty much across the chest. It was made by uh, the firm of Boucheron, um, I believe in 1929, and um, it was designed by Lucien Hertz. And if you look at the stones, they're all specifically carved to fit within the mounting, and it incorporates all of the aspects of Art Deco. It's got that geometric symmetry. It's got the explosions of opposing colors from opposite sides of the color wheel. Um, It's got the balance created by the drop on the bottom. And it's got these curlicuing um, volutes on the side, which add to the appeal of the geometry. It's one of the most extraordinary pieces in the world. And I believe it's currently part of the Boucheron collection. And the interesting thing about this piece as well, Diana, is that before you get away from that, just very quickly, this is not an expensive piece of jewelry intrinsically. The emerald, we are sure, but the, the, the turquoise and the lapis and the corals were not intrinsically as valuable as the design. Exactly. Good point. Very good point. Do okay. we have Nancy back? Yep. Nancy, are you back? We have Nancy's image, but still no sound. This is one of Nancy's favorites as well. So um, she oh, contributed really? that last comment. Oh, well. This jewel is just one of the most glorious things I've ever seen, and I wanted to share it with everybody who's listening to show them what perhaps the quintessence of Art Deco jewelry is. It encapsulates every definition of Art Deco. Um, Next, we have Coco Chanel. Um, Is Nancy able to speak or not? Nancy, can Can you hear hear us? We can. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can. Yeah. Yeah. Go. I'm so glad because in terms of the deco period, uh, Coco Chanel was very, very, very important influence. We, you just mentioned, and I have heard, heard all of this, I don't- um, Oh, good, good. About good. People, want, people wanted happiness. Now, Coco Chanel was very influential in liberating uh, women. First, she did it in World War I, and she had uh, dressing when the women were going back to work. And here she was, this rebel, and she wanted happiness, she wanted freedom, she wanted uh, multiples. So she combined, and she was the first one actually, to combine faux and fine jewelry. She um, had pearls and diamonds and rhinestones and crystals and jet, and she did it all. But she was a very, very influential person in making this happen because this was a time when women were able to express themselves and they could do it. And she was over the top, but she made it possible for women to make their own mark. So she was very, very influential in the jewelry industry. And we'll we'll circle back to that. I hope I have the opportunity to, and you can hear me and I don't phase out. So we can go. Right. Remember, Remember too, that we're coming into... 1929. So this period is murky financially, but interestingly enough, it is not murky in jewelry. There was a trajectory. They dipped. I'm not saying that everyone sat around there and said, okay, we'll just ignore the fact that 
we have no money and we're jumping out of windows. But Julie did go on. It got reevaluated. This was a financial crisis. This was a loss of life due to finances and bad investments and bad timing. But we Julie survived. We of ourselves, but um, uh, Coco Chanel was very um, influential actually in the depression period because he exactly. actually helped save the dollar industry, um, which if we go to the next slide, which is the uh, Comité, which uh, was the um, Bijou Diamond, which she was asked to create to uh, help save and create fine jewelry. Now, this was highly unusual for a designer, a, a, a couturier designer, to create jewelry, but she was asked to do this. And perhaps Michael or Diana, you may be able to um, elaborate a little bit more when we were talking offline about the, the uh, suppliers and specific other jewelers that she approached, uh, was uh, that approached her actually to help side, save the diamond industry going into the depression. And um, she brought back diamond. pearls. She definitely brought back the concept of pearls and overloading your person with it. She was really probably the quintessential feel-good designer. She also supported new talent. She liked you, she hired you. She did it with Foco Vidura, and there are about three or four other major designers, not only in jewelry, who got their start working for Coco. This was a time where people needed jobs, they were talented, and she said, fine. She's wearing one of the examples, that's Foco's um, uh, manchette, as we call oh, them. Vidura cups, yes. Um, one thing to put it in a historical context, to bring it back to the, the, the talk, um, let's not forget that in 1929, we had the great crash, the stock market crash. Um, and a lot of us are experiencing that to a certain degree right now. Yeah. But I really think since 1929, there has not been um, a financial cataclysm similar to that. Um, I remember my grandfather was a traveling salesman um, and he made a lot of money and he invested his entire fortune in the stock market. And when the stock market crashed, he lost everything. And I remember my mother telling me that she had to walk to school with newspapers in the soles of her shoes rather than shoe leather because they couldn't afford to put extra leather soles on her shoes. I mean, I think it's very difficult for people these days to understand that level of sacrifice and deprivation. So when you think about moving from the Art Deco period of opulence and excess, and then moving from the depression into the 1930s where the finances were in the tank, um, it's an interesting time period. And as Nancy said, um, Chanel was approached by the French diamond industry because they could not sell diamonds. So here they reached out to a known brand because at this particular time, Chanel was a known name and they asked her to design a line of diamond jewelry. Chanel herself did not particularly care for diamonds or expensive precious stones. She really had a great deal of contempt for them. And she often mixed precious stones and semi-precious stones. It was about the look to her, not the stones themselves. But as Nancy said, in this particular time period, she was approached by the French diamond dealers and she created these beautiful uh, sprays of jewelry that were sold at the time and they still sell today. Is there anything else you wanted to add about that, Nancy? You, you know what too, Diana, you mentioned something very important to you. You said your father was a traveling salesperson. My grandpa, my grandpa. Yeah, your grandpa. And, and very importantly, because before that, traveling salesmen were not great. My my. Former prior boss Julius Cohen's first day of work was the Black Friday. And mm -hmm. it was at this point, this is almost the great age of the traveling jeweler mm -hmm. making private house calls because the money wasn't in the major cities. It was in the South. It was in the Midwest. It was in Texas. And people took to the roads. And this was kind of the do rigueur. The idea of the traveling salesman nowadays is salesperson is not really in, but that was a phenomena of the 30s and the 40s and the 50s. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, absolutely. So uh, it's, it's the connection and the awareness. Yes, Nancy. It, sorry, hold on one second. Let me see if I can get Nancy's sound to come through again. Nancy, can you hear, try to say something? Hear me, I'm so sorry about this. Oh, yeah, um, we can hear. So we can hear. This is this is very interesting. If you look at the images of the of the uh, necklaces here, the one on 
on my right actually is actually is open. There's no class. And this was also very much in keeping with um, Chanel because she was a rebel. She was a, she was a, in great defiance. She wanted, and there were different components. She wanted stars, she wanted uh, comets, and she wanted constellations. She wanted women to have a feel of explosion. But this piece is a very interesting piece because unlike, um, it, it has a feeling of not having containment. So during the depression and coming out of the depression, she wanted to have that where women could express themselves. So this is, this is a very interesting piece to see. It's unusual in jewelry and they still are now doing that today in um, uh, re bringing that back. This, this was the period also where there wasn't, if you look at this necklace, this is the statement necklace. Women were now looking to create jewels and they would do their clothing around it. That is a total reverse of what's been happening for the last 200 years. In other words, the jewel came first and you decided what dress you were going to design for that necklace. So the sensibility of the 30s was another, another heightened awareness, not 25 pieces of jewelry, but four or five opulent and large pieces or costume if you couldn't afford the fine. Mm -hmm. It was all about the look. It was this new look. Um, so Daisy Fellows was the singer sewing machine heiress. She was born into tremendous wealth. Uh, she had several husbands. Um, and there was a quote that was said about her. And the quote goes thusly. Um, she lived on cocaine, grouse, and other women's husbands. <laughs> In fact, I believe at one point she seduced one of her daughter's boyfriends. She was quite the unusual woman. And... Um, a rara avis at that. In any case, um, if you see this extraordinary necklace that Cartier made for her, um, they designed it in 1936 and she purchased it in 1937. This is very emblematic of this, this Eastern sort of motif with this Indian explosion of color. Now, uh, the Indians would probably not have mixed the emeralds with the sapphires, but Cartier extrapolated upon this Indian sort of motif of the mixed colored stones and the carved stones. And they created this extraordinary necklace for her, which is called the uh, the Hindu necklace or le collier hindu. And it's currently owned by the Cartier collection. And but really if you look at the picture, you can see her wearing it. And you could see this sort of devil may care attitude in her body language. And she's holding a cigarette and she's got all this extraordinary jewelry on. And she's got so much money and she does not care that the world has just experienced a depression and everybody is suffering. And not only that, look at how much of the necklace you're seeing in that outfit. Mm -hmm. Exactly four inches of an 18 inch piece of jewelry. So we look at it and our jaws drop. And it was it was worn incredibly ca um, casually, and the outfit went with it. It's like heavily embroidered. Mm -hmm. This was part of the look. Can we hear Nancy? No, I can't. And where her sound's not coming in. Okay, you can hear us. Yeah, and honestly, um, uh, um, Diane is correct. They didn't care for the sapphires. Yes, new slide. Uh, can Nancy speak about this, or can we not hear her? Think Diana, we're not getting her sound through at all. Okay, that's unfortunate because this is, I think, Nancy's favorite topic in the whole in the whole presentation. Uh, this whole this whole concept of the Hollywood stars. Now, in the 1930s, when uh, certainly America and a lot of the rest of the world was in a deep depression, um, um, a lot of the movie stars made these films to help lift people's spirits. And for a nickel, my mom used to tell me, you could pay a nickel and go to the movies and you could be swept away from reality into this extraordinary world that was created by all these wonderful black and white movies in the 1930s. And in those days, many of the stars, and you see Marlene Dietrich here on the screen, they all wore their own jewels. This is the time when the famous Hollywood jeweler, Paul Flato, made pieces of jewelry and many of the stars wore his pieces. Um, there's a wonderful book called Hollywood Jewels uh, by Penny Prado that documents all of these uh, stars wearing these wonderful pieces of jewelry. And if you like old movies, when you're watching the movie, don't just pay attention to the story of the movie. Look at the jewelry that the women are wearing because it's probably <laughs> real. Nancy, is your sound coming through again? It looks like your microphone's back on. 
Is it on? Okay. There's also another thing that's very important that actually started. Can you hear me? Um, yes, we can hear you. Hear me? Keep going. Okay. Yep. And it started actually in the 20s, but you actually see it very much here in the 30s. And that was that, that neck was very important. Ears were very important. All these. We've lost Nancy's microphone again. Sorry, she's got a really bad connection problem in her building, I think. Right. Diana, yeah. Nancy, you yeah. know what you're going to say to finish that thought? Yeah, what Nancy was saying about this is that um, the fact of the matter is that not only that, jewelry was also a means of hedging your bets in the 1930s. Paulette Gardner is thought to have had one of the best collections as well. Um, and if you look at the style difference, folks, in the, 10 years earlier, there would have been a riot of color and there would have been much more necklaces going on. You're getting two or three pieces that are working with each other, that bracelet, the two of them on Melinda Dietrich's arm. This is a combination of empowerment. And you see that this is no longer an, a Victoria, an Edwardian lady. This is no longer a flapper. These are very strong yeah. images of women and jewelry yeah. does it. Yes, absolutely. And also pay attention to the strength of these large cuffs. Um, I'm pretty sure that the one on the left in black and white, the two braces are by Mobusin and she owned them. And um, I think the ruby one was, I believe, Van Cleef and Arpel. But the point is it was a large, large single bracelet as opposed to rows of smaller bracelets that you would have seen in the deco era. And then if you look at the ear treatment, it's usually clip on earrings close right. to the face as opposed to long dropping earrings linear and geometric that we would have seen in the Art Deco period. So as Nancy just tried to explain, unfortunately, before she got cut off, this was a big stylistic change as a result of the change in women's place in society, all of which resulted from World War I. Exactly. And the ear clips are much more practical because if you are working, if you are making movements, dangling earrings are lovely and they're seductive, but that's not what women are looking for now. They want to be treated in a very different way. They've, they've, they've had jobs in the 1920s. Now they want to keep them. And in the 30s, everyone's working. Now we can talk about the theater foreigner for talking about lower end jewelry a little bit. And this is something that a lot of you people who deal in estate jewelry might see from time to time. Um, these pieces were made in Germany. Uh, they were mounted in silver. But we wanted to show it to you because we wanted you to see and, and, and feel that deco sensibility where you had uh, the juxtaposition of color, where you had the linear geometry. Is there anything else you'd like to say about Farner? Um, yeah. Yeah. yeah, Farner is interesting. He holds a lot of patents and they would have considered this, um, this jewelry to be um, basically, he had a very good idea. He loved design. He felt that good design shouldn't be expensive. It should be affordable to everyone. And he died actually in 1919. But the company had so many great patents and very good design designers on it. It lasted until the early 60s, believe it or not. It finally went under. But remember, they thought silver was not. So when we look at a piece of silver nowadays, we go, oh, it's nothing. It's like, oh my God, it's silver. It's expensive. It wasn't at that time period, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but it was still the sensibility, not watered down. He did not water down his designs with Marcusites, turquoises, lapis. He combined the best of the arts and crafts with the best of mechanization, which we are always still trying to do. And Farner is good. All right, so now we wanted to speak to you a little bit about World War II and its impact on the world. Um, in the United States, we always think of World War II as 1941 through 1945, but in point of fact, World War II pretty much started in 1939. Um, in 1933, Hitler was declared chancellor in Germany. In 1939, he walked into Poland. In 1940, the Nazis walked into Paris. And then in 1941, when the United States entered the war with uh, the attack on Pearl Harbor, that's when we started. But actually, the changes that affected the jewelry industry were starting prior to World War II's declaration on the part of the United States. Um, what we wanted to speak to you about stylistically was uh, in this photograph, you can see the emphasis and influence of tanks. If you look on the upper right-hand portion of the image, you can see what an actual tank looked like 
from World War II. And then you could see how that style was translated into these domed curved bracelets that you would have seen in the late 30s and in the early 1940s. Um, there was also a profusion of uh, different colors of gold. And Michael and I, and hopefully Nancy, if she can come back, will be explaining that to you in a couple of images later. But we wanted you to see this, this geometric, heavy, tank-like appearance in these bracelets, which are still very popular to this day. Michael, right. Yeah, the, um, the 1930s, Europe was playing in design with modernistic, the modern period. Mm -hmm. We softened it up, and but we kept the gas pipe, which you'll see later on, mm -hmm. the geometric, the, the, the heaviness. Now, looking at these pieces, folks, you think these are very heavy? They're not. They are hollow in many cases. In America, we went for bulk, and we didn't have a lot of gold to work with. So we had to modify the work. The look of it is vol is volumetrically large. Mm -hmm. The weight is less. Europe didn't go that way because in Europe, everything was heavy and it was meant to be heavy. One of the differences of Europe to America, and we didn't particularly, the jewelry we're going to be showing you for the World War II, some of it was during the war, some of it was right after. You know the ones that are right after. But mm -hmm. the ones during it, remember, America wasn't like, oh, good, let's go to war. It's like, let's, how many pieces can we sell to everybody? So there had to be a way of getting this information across. Mm -hmm. Now, the next image we have is of um, a Cartier tank watch. Um, and Nancy had, had been very eager to share her knowledge with you about this particular type of item. Um, I'm not that wonderful with watches. I don't know a ton about them. I mean, I do know that the uh, the Cartier tank watch was created to emulate that sort of tank tread motif that you had seen in the prior image. And um, Michael, is there anything else you could say about it? Yeah, basically the Cartier tank watch, the whole thing came about is that if you had what was had before World War One, in fact, were pocket watches. And if you were a gentleman, you had a pocket watch. Well, if you're driving a tank or flying a plane, pocket watches aren't the best. Impractical. Impractical. And not only that, the bands weren't great because they would rip off. The leather wasn't strong enough. So they needed a watch band that would hold on to the links that wouldn't rip off, that wouldn't necessarily catch, but you mm -hmm. could get out of. So it was a technical innovation that the designers mm -hmm. brought up on. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and then next we have an image of jewelry that you would have seen during the war. Um, this particular bracelet is really quite charming and beautiful. It's uh, by the firm of Boucheron, one of the most prestigious French jewelry firms. And um, it's a restricted items train bracelet. So you can see that it's in the form of charm after charm to emulate a train. And what you see on there are things that people have been deprived of during the course of the war. Um, travel, I, I've seen them with, with bottles of champagne. I mean, all the things that people had to give up during the course of the war, uh, which is, is something that our generation knows nothing about. We have really never been deprived of anything. So right now we find ourselves in a time where we are deprived of being able to go out. And this is a new experience for people these days, but please be sure that there have been many times in the course of human history that people have not been able to do what they wanted to do, either for health reasons or political reasons or financial reasons. And these sort of jewels that you will see during World War II were very emblematic of the sacrifices people were making at the time. The next image is a charming little uh, plane that Michael would like to tell you. And I, I loved it when I saw this image. I was so happy he chose this for the presentation. Michael? Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is an, these two images I chose. They both have um, uh, flight in in their area. Obviously, this was done near the end of World War II. Um, one, the top right, <laughs> they've got a bomb for each person in each event, so they had to have known it. This was a personal sentiment. It's bakelite. It's wood. And obviously it is held up. It's made actually very beautifully. This was probably a private jeweler making something of his own feeling about it. Good sense of design, the Bakelite. And 
Interestingly enough, the element on the left, the bracelet on the left, was worn not only by women, but by men. Mm. I remember my father having one very similar to that. Um, elements were being used and being worn, not only paraded out on special occasions, but as a reminder immediately of what happened. Mm -hmm. that. And I don't know if people who are um, participating in the in the uh, presentation can see this, but on one side of the plane, you have uh, the the word Nazi, and I, I and, and I, I can't see the other. On the yeah. other side, you have Tojo, who was who was uh, the emperor of China and Japan of, of Japan rather, and Japan. So you can see that one side was all German enemies, and the other side was all Japanese enemies. So it's a charming little costume jewelry piece, but it's really full of color and full of style and full of meaning for a time period when people needed this sort of thing. They needed and incredibly powerful. Time. If you were yes. to Madeleine Albright, you Absolutely. would basically faint. Yeah, exactly, Madeleine Albright. Absolutely. She'd faint with this one. Yeah, she sure would. All right, next, um, one of Michael's favorites is these these victory pins. You know, they, they go from costume to the top left, the sweetheart for the girlfriend who has a husband, brother, father in the war, to the Van Cleef and Appel um, lace design that's an inverted V. They used it as well. Um, the Traubert and Halfer is the image in the center. And those actually... They don't say it, but I would think very strongly that the ruby on the top is a synthetic and the sapphire is a synthetic, and that is definitely a moonstone in the middle. So this was a combination of, this is an example of what the war brought. We didn't have things to play with. We didn't have the diamonds or the stones, so the stones were little. And we had a lot of stones, which I'm not even going to talk about. Diana will talk about that later on. But the all of those V pins, all those are all victory. Mm -hmm. Everybody had it. Mm -hmm. yeah. And the next image, um, I believe this is a black and white ad, probably from a newspaper that Michael had sourced for us. But this is an example of how fine jewelers were getting in on this victory concept. And you see that these were made by Caltier, but also our very own um, American company, Oscar Heyman and Brothers, were known for a beautiful uh, flying flag pin which they started making uh, during World War II. And they make that pin in several different sizes to this very day. And they actually put the images on each part of the map, New York, California, Texas, mm -hmm. South, and the Northern manufacturing area. Mm -hmm. And the prices range from 240 to a thousand dollars. So this was in 1946. And, and that was real money. Fifth Avenue. Yeah. So the next image is uh, yet another one of the victory things. Uh, these are costume, Michael, is that correct? Yeah, these are definitely costumes. They're Bakelite, in fact, which one of mm -hmm. natural areas as well. And they're imitating the um, the places where you've been theoretically on the top squares up there. This mm -hmm. is purely as a decorative item that you're mm -hmm. appreciating it. A little mm -hmm. more than just a V. And then next we have, um, a beautiful piece of jewelry made by the firm of Mauboussin, uh, uh, Tente de Libération. So you can see that you've got a flag that can be, that can that is the French flag with the three colors, red, white, and blue. And there's um, a tank there, a, a car that shows that the French had won the war, finally. And America had won the war and we had defeated the Nazis and the Japanese. Uh, but you can see that the design of these, um, this is not done by an amateur. These were done with people who understood um, the fine elements of jewelry, but they were making them understandable for the population at large, not for a small select group. Exactly. Now, our next image, um, when we were preparing this for you, Michael and I immediately said the uncaged bird. And the significance of this is I will tell you about before the war and Michael will explain why this um, bird pin is so significant. Bird pins have always been a very important part of jewelry culture. And um, when the war started, a lot of the French jewelers made pieces of jewelry with birds that were closed within a cage because they felt that they themselves were caged by the Nazis. And then when we finally won the war and defeated the Nazis, Cartier created this pin. So Michael, do you want to take over from now? Yeah, the, the, the light part of the, the caged bird and the freed bird um, and the whimsicality of it was amazing. 
I'm, they said the Nazis didn't know that the Nazis weren't stupid, but the Nazis had no way to prevent this. Um, remember, what happened in 1939, folks, was the World's Fair. Mm -hmm. So this was a very edgy time. And several months after the fair opened, it's so much for Paris. Um, so this was a great way of expressing quietly their feeling. Um, how they got away with it, I don't know. Because this was a, this was a declaration of the resistance to exactly. the French. But we've won the war, and it's 1945, and everything is going to be changing. So what happened at the end of World War II? We have a number of things going on. We have um, soldiers coming back to America. They want to start new lives. Um, America has won, and it was the ascendancy of America. So you have the strength of America and American jewelers um, starting to grow. Um, you also are going to see a stylistic change. You are going to see more of a profusion of um, semi-precious stones. During World War II, it was virtually impossible to obtain precious stones. Jewelers needed to provide jewelry for clients who wanted jewelry, so they sourced large stones such as amethyst and citrine, and they mounted them in um, gold jewelry with accents on the sides of small colored precious stones. So anytime you see a large cocktail ring with a big amethyst or a big citrine and either sapphires or rubies at the shoulders, you can be pretty sure that it was made during the 1940s. Now this particular suite of jewelry you see in front of you is called a passepartout or go everywhere, which is the way it was titled by the firm of Van Cleef and Arpel, which came up with it in 1939. The form of chain that you see there is a tubo gas. It's kind of a stretchy sort of chain. Um, and this was the period of time where they started using, using gold almost as fabric. It was woven. Um, it was uh, crocheted. There were lots of different ways of working with gold because keep in mind, gold is a fungible commodity. If you have a big, heavy gold bracelet on your wrist and you need to get out of Dodge because mm -hmm. the Nazis are coming in the door, mm -hmm. you have gold there. And make no mistake, there were plenty of expatriate royalty who came to the United States after the war, and all they left with were their jewels. But they were able to start lives again in the United States with all the jewelry that they had taken with them. So jewelry is very much of a valuable commodity in the event of disasters. But here you have this passepartout, and it says go everywhere because you can disassemble the elements and you could see at the top, it can be attached to a comb to wear in the hair. It can be attached to an additional tubo gas chain and wear it as a, as a belt. You can wear them as clip pins together or separately. And uh, they were made with pastel colored sapphires and pastel um, yellow sapphires and blue sapphires because you obviously could not get the finer stones. And it's a beautiful color sensibility that is very desirable up until this day. <laughs> Say that again. We lost him. I can't hear anyone. Can you hear me? Hello? Oh, hello, here we are. We're back. Are we back? Can you hear me? I can't hear. I can't hear Andrea. Oh. That's because, okay, I oh, have the microphone muted. Um, oh, my dear. Okay. <laughs> okay. Just, you know, technology day at our houses. Okay. Michael, okay. Okay. The point I'm trying to make is that the materials that were not available to us in the United States affected the jewelry greatly. As Diana said, and she'll talk about this more later, is that we had to go to other sources, which meant Brazil. Metal, white metal, platinum was off the table, as was, as was palladium. So we had to use what was available, which was the rose gold of South America, mm -hmm. or the highly alloyed materials they were cheaper to use. So the idea of gold jewelry was in, and as Diana says, you will see rubies and sapphires, but the leftover stock and used as side stones. The essential stones are not. Let me go to the next for Diana. Oh, okay. 
Um, so this is an example of um, jewelry, almost as fabric. If you look at the uh, sides of the necklace, you can see that it's uh, more of that tubal gas chain, which was very, very popular in the 1940s. And you see this, this wonderful spill, this lush profusion of gold balls set with diamonds just spilling out from the center of the necklace. Um, you do see a lot of tricolor and bicolor gold jewelry from this time period, but it's important to look at the proportion on this design because sign jewelry is signed for a reason. It has a certain tight sensibility in the design that you just do not see in pieces that are not signed by famous houses. This is a very, very elegant and luxurious necklace by Van Cleef and Arpel in 1943 that's beautifully, beautifully balanced. Anything, Michael, or no? And the topic, and the topic on that one is basically a, um, that's basically water pipe spilling out. <laughs> it's basically, yeah. it's like a yeah, corner. Good point. Out, very good totally point. Totally industrial, totally industrial. So when we're talking about the 1930s, and we're just jumping back a teeny bit, um, you could use the word chunky to describe the jewelry in the 1930s. The jewelry in the 1920s was very, very streamlined and flat. And in juxtaposition, the jewelry from the 1930s had an almost swollen look, as you see in the bracelets on the right and in the rings on the left. Uh, the bracelet that you see in black and white on the lower right actually was the property of the Duchess of Windsor. It was given to her by her husband-to-be just prior to their marriage before he abdicated the British throne. Um, guys, we, I, I don't want it. And folks, and folks, remember that in times of crises, we tend, the 40s, late 40s and early 50s wasn't very innovative design-wise. We wanted what was familiar. We wanted some reassurance that this was a style I liked seven years ago. I couldn't afford it now. I want it now. So we were not innovative. We were just allowing the designs to come forth. So you don't get a lot of innovations. You see it almost revitalized in gold and less expensive material. Are we out of time, Andrea? Well, we are. And I want to make sure there's enough yeah. time to answer questions. Oh, fine. Sure. Answer sure. Questions. So could I just pop through the slides and you guys each yes. tell me? Absolutely. Let's do it. On the top of your do head. One. Do sure. it. All right, so another aspect of the 1930s jewelry was convertible. Again, look at the whiteness, look at the level of volume, which is a direct juxtaposition to the 1920s jewelry. And there was jewelry that you could take apart and do different things with. I'm done. Next. Uh, you see a lot of clips, clip sets that were worn either on um, a lapel or they were attached to a bracelet and you could wear them on the bracelet or you could wear them separately as pins attached you to your could, You could change your neckline with that from a sweetheart exactly. to a pin thing. Exactly. Next. You guys next. are such support. Yeah, so next? this is actually a page from the 1920. Um, well, let's pass on this one. Let's go to the next one. Yeah. Next image. All right, so we were talking, and Michael was talking about the use of semi-precious stones. Um, you see a great deal of citrine, which is what you see on the bracelet on the left. And look at the very subtle gradation of color between the darker stones in the center and getting paler and approaching the color of the gold on the left. And on the right, you see a necklace that's all just aquamarines and pale aquamarines at that. They're not good quality stones, but it is the design and the clever usage of the semi-precious stones that was so characteristic of jewelry from the 1940s. We tend to revisit everything in the past, in times of crisis, the jewelers were saying, what's out there and what can we get and what what can we give people? Mm -hmm. What's the matter of it? So this is very important. The next image. Next, uh, this is a wonderful jewel by uh, the term of Trayvon and Hoffer Maubassin. Maubassin is a, a famous French jewelry firm, but they partnered with uh, the Chicago firm of Trayvon and Hoffer, and they created a line of jewels called Reflections, where you got to pick the stones you wanted to put in there, and you got to pick the elements, all of which would fit together to make quote unquote, a reflection of your own personality. But once again, look at the large citrine in the center. Look at the amethyst surrounding it. The stones in and of themselves are not valuable, but it's it's voluptuous, it's domed, it uses the semi-precious stones, everything characteristic of the 40s. Exactly. Next. Next, okay. And Michael, volume, volume bracelets. Yeah. Just volume bracelets from the 30s. Yeah. 
again, if you look at these, and you're seeing a kind of similarity, the, the jewelry preceding World War II and preceding afterwards are almost interchangeable in sense of design. It's the materials and the way in which we're handling the metal, the way in which we're piercing it, the way in which we're decorating the surface. The pave is going to go less and less, and it's going to come back later on. But right now, we don't like to change a lot when we've gone through a crisis. We like to, we like we like things that are familiar to us. And this was familiar in the 30s. It's familiar in 1949. So we just have three more quick images. Uh, the first one is a page of cocktail jewelry designs. If you think about all these men coming back from the war, and in the same way that men returning from World War One were grateful to be alive and they wanted to start their lives again, you look at these cocktail jewels, these large voluminous cocktail jewels from the 1950s, the late 40s and early 50s, and you can see that people wanted to relax, have a martini and have fun. And this is the beginning of those cocktail jewels from the 1950s. The next image is just an ad from Harry Winston. And you can see the beginning of this return back to this linear white look that harkens back to the Art Deco era. But that's the beginning of the 50s, and that's another set of stories that we can talk about at another time. Well, and Diana, I'm pulling up the last slip, uh, slide, but you said something interesting about the evolution of all the flower power hippie jewelry, too, mm -hmm. when we were just chatting. Share that insight, because we've had other times when jewelry has reacted to well, you know, I've, I've given many lectures on the 1960s, and I'm, I don't know whether I'm proud or ashamed to admit that I lived through them. Um, <laughs> my boyfriend at the time invited me to Woodstock, and my mother wouldn't let me go. And I, I don't think I spoke to her for two months. In any case, I think if you live through the 1960s, you have a very deep understanding of how pivotal that time period was. Um, if you are younger and listening to this um, presentation and you're not aware of it, there were so many things going on in the 60s. Um, um, there was the hippie revolution. There was drugs. There were there was sex and drugs and rock and roll. It was the beginning of, of the Beatles. The, the Vietnam the War. War. Yes. Yeah. And it was the Vietnam War. It was a very edgy period. Um, they. It's a very hard time to classify because there were so many undercurrents and overcurrents. And in the 60s, you had jewelry, but now you had jewelry you locked up in the safe and brought out, and you had jewelry that you could wear in the daytime. Yes. And that was was very edgy. Very edgy. In addition to that, you had, you know, we showed you these pictures of cocktail jewelry because it was this very ladylike, you know, pin on the lapel sort of look. But in that explosion of the hippie revolution in the 1960s, you saw um, ethnic jewelry, you saw women wearing beads, you saw women wearing uh, crystals as talismans, which we're not going to see jewelry. moving forward in the years. Uh, this was a tremendously revolutionary period in terms of jewelry. So in the context of what we're speaking about, um, it wasn't necessarily as cataclysmic as a pandemic or a war, but the 60s was really very much of a revolution. And for those of you who did not live through it, it would be worth your while to just Google it and do a teeny bit of research on it. And just, you know, it's one thing to read about history in a book because it seems very frozen in time and very unrelated to you. Right. But in a way, it's, it's, it's very interesting to be living through these times where 50 and 100 years from now, people are going to be writing in history books about what we're living through. So it's we need to try to take away from this what is most beneficial as a learning experience for us as individuals and as human beings, because we are helping to create the fabric of history, not just the history of people, but jewelry history as well. You mentioned six points in the original conversation we had, Andrea, in this. And one of them is, Crises generally brings in awareness. Yeah, absolutely. There is, and there is a search for the ability or to achieve a feel-good feeling or allowing us to feel good. We go through it and we want to be able to feel good. We need that. The materials are all revisited. All new alternatives, your designs. People feel less adventuresome in a time of crisis. Mm -hmm. it, it takes a very strong person to say, I'm blowing everything out of the water because you're adding another layer of yes, absolutely have to consider it. So remember that we tend to fall back in times of crisis. Mm -hmm. Number 
<laughs> number five was the need to connect. And if you look in all of these crisis periods, however you connect, to say hello, to travel as a traveling salesman, to make sure people get the message out. Mm -hmm. And those are my five or six points. And are there any questions? There, there was a question that kind of related to where we were going. Maria, so how do we think the question. design and change after COVID? She wants to know how do we think the oh, um, material do you want us to answer this or do you want this to be the subject of another discussion? <laughs> no, no, I didn't want to present on fut the future forecasts. I wanted the history and the presentation, but by all means, we're in Q&A. Now we can go for it. You know what? Let me just say very quickly. No one has looked into um, sterile objects. Silver has traditionally been a germ killer. Mm -hmm. And I was reading a very interesting article reading into this. They injected silver solution into some of these viruses. Not only does it kill the virus, it acts like a zombie. It attracts other viruses to feast on it, and they die within 99% of the time. Go Which silver. is not, not a commercial for colloidal silver people, okay? No. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. But, but the point of the matter is, is that if I'm going to eat up a fruit, it's going to be silver nowadays. Yes, and then there are a number of people who believe that copper, copper too, is, copper is wonderful. Maybe. So you might see a number of different metals appearing that not only are useful in jewelry, but also as protection against some sort of health crisis. Additionally, I think you're going to see a lot of. Um, um, mystically protective jewels like yeah, crystal. Yeah, I think you're going to see that. that. And one other thing that I envision, I mean, I don't know how much this concept of masks is going to be part of our future, but I do know that during, um, in, in Venice, during Lent, when they have all those masked balls, there was a period of time in the 15 or 1600s, I believe, where doctors, doctors, not the people going to the parties, but doctors, yeah would wear a mask and they would wear gloves and they would have a long stick to point at people who were ill. So they were using the mask, not just for decorative purposes, but also to protect themselves. So there's a possibility there will be a profusion of jewels on masks of some sort if this becomes a necessity. Um, it's, it's difficult to know exactly where this is going to go. We're really in what's called a black swan, meaning uncharted territory that was completely unanticipated. So I think all options are open, but based on what I know about jewelry history, I would say that metals are going to change to perhaps become more talismanic and protective. Uh, the stones that we use are going to become more talismanic and protective. And I think that we might be incorporating uh, protective wear into the jewelry, assuming that we don't find some sort of um, um, cure for this virus or some sort of. I, I, can, I can concur with um, with um, with Diana very much. We're going to look for talismanics. We haven't spoken about religious jewelry. I, I if I look into it, of course, I can yeah. assure you that they're going to go up. Very good point. Excellent point. One insight I took from what you guys were sharing is that designers also helped shape consumer feelings about jewelry. They use design language to express the feeling of the day. So for the designers in this audience today, you can be thinking about how you can express some of these things in your own design language. You're not just being influenced, you are also influencing. Being we, the influencer, absolutely. Right, we, 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 okay. Part, no, I was just going to say that many times the fine, the fashion jewelry houses did not look at the tastes of the population. They mm -hmm. looked at the clients. Mm -hmm. What you see in times of crisis, jewelers look at the people at large, not at the one or two individuals. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we have a question here from Chris, and he says, with the level of furloughs and unemployment, what retail price points would be more sought after? And this is a wonderful question. And I am so grateful, Chris, that you asked this question. Yeah. Because if there's one thing all of us have learned from studying jewelry history, it's that no matter how bad things are, there's always people out there with a ton of money to buy money. fabulous jewelry. Conversely, there are other people who do not have enough money to buy a piece of jewelry. However, it is very important to remember that the purchase of a piece of jewelry is not just the purchase of 
a collection of stones in a piece of metal that you put on your finger. The purchase of a piece of jewelry, it, you're buying the ability to create a memory. Mm -hmm. You're buying proof of your affection or love for this particular person. You're buying all the things that jewelry represents. So I don't care if somebody is making $20,000 a year and they can barely pay the rent. If they want to get married and they're in love with somebody, they are going to buy a jewel no matter how small for that person that they love because it's what the jewel represents. It's Remember. not just the value of the jewel. And keep in mind that there is nothing more unessential than jewelry, let's face facts. However, that is precisely why it is so essential. Just because you don't really need it, but you go out of your way to buy it for someone you love, even if that someone you love is yourself, that's what makes it so essential. And so remember, to his question, I think there are going to be low price points for that market. And I think that there's also going to be an explosion of the very expensive market too. I think what you have and what you mentioned that is there is love in times of crisis. A friend of mine just got engaged this morning and he'll be looking for a ring for her. Yes. This is done, this is done virtually online. Mm -hmm. So the point of the matter is, is that Yes, it depends upon who you're choosing to go to. I think what's going to come into play right now is custom jewelry. If you are a small designer or small manufacturer, you are able to do a custom piece. People are going to have very private stories here. Mm -hmm. And people are leaving. You have graduations that are missed. You've got birthdays. You've got gatherings. So I feel very strongly. Price point, it depends where you want to send to yourself. If you want to feel that, a $300 item charm will be enough. That's fine. $2,000, $7,000. It really is a matter of how you view it, how you view your work, and who's going to get it. Well, and who your customer is. I think everybody needs to analysis. who their audience is. So if you have a store in a town where there's a lot of layoffs and there's not, you know, and you don't have a ready um, cadre of high dollar purchasers, then you're probably going to interpret the aftermath into lower price points. If you have a collection of customers that you know are financially insulated from the stress, mm -hmm. then you're going to go up in price point. But mm -hmm. if you have to think about who your customer is and how they're affected, and that will be the right answer for your business. There won't be an answer for all the businesses. Right, there isn't one. No, absolutely not. But the one immutable point that I would like everybody to take away from this is in its lack of essentialness, jewelry is so so deeply essential. I mean, Pink this right. ring that I'm wearing, this is my grandma's ring. And when my grandpa lost all his money during the depression and he finally clawed his way back to having money, this was one of the first things that my grandpa bought for my grandma. And the fact that my grandma gave it to me when she was still alive. And my mother used to ask to borrow it from time to time. So it's got my grandmother's DNA on it, and it's got my mother's DNA. And coming from a three-generation family business, I not only appreciate the value of jewelry as a merchant, but I appreciate the value of jewelry as a woman and a consumer because there is nothing more meaningful than getting a piece of jewelry from somebody who you love and who means a great deal to you. There is no greater pleasure in the world, in my opinion. And you also find that People used to say it's non-essential. Actually, as a human element, the answer is, yeah, it is. Because we are the only creature that adorns ourselves. The other creatures in the world, we don't. It is. It was a very good statement years ago. But the fact is that this is how we do remember. Whether it's, I just came across someone's gold teeth in one of my boxes. I don't know who the hell it was. Uh-huh. The point of the matter is that somebody saved it. Yeah. And it doesn't have to be intrinsically valuable. And that is one of the things I hope you take away from these, these hundred years that we've looked at, that it is a matter of, it doesn't matter. You can make a baby tooth exquisitely with diamonds. You can make it with a string and wrap it around with wire. So it is a matter of how you approach it. And as Andrea said, who is the person who's going to get it. Is it exactly. Diana with her ring? Is it somebody that I have to make for Andrea or is it myself? Mm -hmm. 
Well, on those thoughts, I think we're a wrap. I don't see any more questions coming in. I, first, I have to say thank you to Nancy, who has got to be pulling her hair out with frustration right now. Mm -hmm. I'm so sorry you didn't get to hear her today because mm -hmm. it is a delight to talk with and listen to, and she's just got so much knowledge. So we're going to fix this so she can, I, first of all, I think to do this again because you only scratched the surface of jewelry history and clearly mm -hmm. We have an audit. Yeah, we just got that. Please offer another covering the 50s through the present so we can talk about that. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Get these guys to do that and we'll fix Nancy's system. 70s um, is really fun. That, you're going to love dinosaurs in the 80s. Okay. <laughs> and Diane, thank you so much. Um, thank you for asking us. And we are, Michael and I are both so thrilled to be able to share all the knowledge that we have, not just on an intellectual basis, but on a very, very personal basis, because I know we both live, breathe, and study jewelry, and it's we're just so happy to be able to share this with everybody. We'll even teach you how to scan somebody to see what they really want in the way of jewelry. They're a wonderful <laughs> Good idea, good yeah. idea. And everybody knows that. It's like, okay. We've got all our webinars for the next like six months plan now. Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. In closing, I would also like to tell you that when, uh, when you exit the system, you will go to a landing page or you can go to the MJSA website. For those of you who are, you know, staying in those high price points, there's lots of information that we talk about that all the time about fine jewelry. For those of you who are thinking about stepping into some bridge jewelry for a little while, MJSA has made some articles available from the journal on manufacturing processes and techniques that will help you with some of those lower price points. So all those links are available to you in the page after you close this window or in the um, in the at the MJSA.org website on the webinars page underneath this webinar. So thank you to all of you for joining us today. Your time is precious. We appreciate you spending it with us. And again, thank you to Michael and Diana and Nancy for everything you did to put this presentation together. They were working in the hours this morning, still negotiating all of their images. And and thank you, to Andrea. You make it a joy. Yes, absolutely. Um, absolutely. And we'll see you guys all next week. Uh, of course, I'm supposed to remember what the webinar is for next week, and I'm blanking on it this moment. But I can tell you this. If you go to the webinar, the, the MJSA website, you will see all the webinars for every week. And I can I'll see you next Thursday at 1 p.m. Eastern with something, whatever it is, I don't remember. Um, Looking forward to it. Hey, all right. Thanks, everybody, so much. Everybody and stay safe out there. Take care. Stay well. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye.